So I'm going to tell a story here, and by the end of it, some of you are going to be busted. Um, and I know who you are, so uh, how's that for an introduction? Um, it was about, oh, about 13 years ago, and some a family had come to visit us from out of town. And after they came and came to church with us, and after church, um, they wanted to take myself and my wife, and I think we only had our oldest at that time, so the three of us out for lunch after church. Now, uh, I hadn't been at Sunny Slope that long, and I was, I was still kind of figuring out the, the, the culture of, of the church, if you, if you will. And one of the things you have to sort of gauge is, what is, it okay, what is okay to do and not do on a Sunday, right? Every church has kind of their different understanding of, you know, do you go to restaurants or not? Do you go shopping or not? Do you go to movies? All those kinds of things. And I was still kind of figuring that all out. And so when the person said, well, let, well I'd like to take you out to lunch, um, I, I said, okay, but in my mind I'm thinking, boy, I hope this doesn't come back to hurt me, right? Because, you know, what happens if word gets out that the minister went to a restaurant on Sunday and this church doesn't go for that? So, okay, so I went with a little trepidation. We went over to Sherry's there on South Commercial. And we walk in the restaurant and the hostess is bringing us to our seat. And she takes us around the corner and no sooner do we round that little corner and I saw a table with six of you sitting there. I won't say who but you know who you are, uh, all sitting at the table there having lunch together. And so we, you know, there's this moment where we all kind of look at each other like, oh, who's going to tell on who here? (laughs) Um, Now, I tell that, I I tell that because, you know, what what do you do on a Sunday? That's one of these things that has, it changes and it's different in lots of different places and lots of different settings. There's all kinds of different understandings. What is, how do you observe the Sabbath day, as it were? What what is okay to do on Sunday? And some of you grew up in in communities where, um, you know, it was very restrictive. It's like, if, you know, you eat lunch on Sunday, but it's like you cook it the day before and you really minimize, you, you definitely don't spend any money on a Sunday and all these kinds of things. And what we've seen in the last probably 25 or 30 years is a, kind of a pendulum shift where now um, it's, it's actually very acceptable to do most of those things. In fact, um, you know, it might even be in some cases that worship is, is almost like it's an option that you add on or it's something that you kind of squeeze in like, you might even do that Saturday night, or you might do it sort of every other week, and Sunday's really all about just taking a day off. And so, and I'm only just saying that to kind of illustrate how the pendulum has, has really swung from one end to the other, and, and that's kind of a way of getting at this idea that there's lots of different ideas about what is okay to do and not do, or maybe to put it a little differently, how do you rest, what does it mean to rest on the day of rest? What does it mean to honor the fourth commandment? And that's what I want us to look at this morning. That's what I want us to kind of dig into. And Hebrews chapter 4, I think, speaks to us uh, a great deal about what that means. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at what what Hebrews 4 says about the promise that God makes to us about rest, the the, the promise that God gives us about rest. And then we're going to look briefly at at the warning, because the writer of Hebrews, as you're going to see, is, is actually warning us about missing that rest, and then Finally, we're going to see there's an invitation to rest, right? How do you, in other words, how do you experience it? So the promise, the warning, the invitation. Now, I don't know about you, but you go through this text, and I, I find it a little difficult to follow the flow of it. Maybe you had that too. Maybe, maybe you're smarter than me and you kind of see more clearly. But there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of references. There's Old Testament quotations. You read quotations from Psalm 95. You read allusions to Genesis 2. You read mentions of the promised land. And you hear talking about Joshua. So there's all this Old Testament material that is all woven into Hebrews 4. In fact, Hebrews 4 is mostly a, a commentary or an explanation of the Old Testament idea of rest. The author of Hebrews is trying to explain what did the Old Testament really say about rest and and how does that apply um, to us today. Now, here's one of the things that I think stands out that's really crucial. If you look with me at verse 8, and it mentions this, it kind of gets at this idea a couple of other places, but verse 8 I think says it clearest, where it says, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Now, what he's really saying is he's talking, of course, about the Israelites in the Old Testament, and he's saying that for the Israelites, there was this promise for them of rest. 
God promised to give his people rest, but they never quite experienced it. They never quite received that rest. Joshua leads them into the promised land, but they still never fully experienced the gift of rest. All right, so, so the rest was still out there, but, um, but, but here's, here, here's what that means. Because the Israelites never experienced it, the author of Hebrews is saying that promise is still there for you and me today. Right? Because the promise of rest was never fully enjoyed by the Israelites, the promise still stands today. Now, just let that sink in for a minute. Because we live, I think, in one of the most um, busy, overwhelmed, uh, fast-paced, high-tech cultures. And into that, into that busyness, and some of you feel that very, very regularly, into that busyness, into that chaos, into that overwhelmed sense of life, God says, I have a promise to give you rest. I have a promise to give you rest. Now that, again, that's massive because if you think about it, my wife pointed this out to me a couple years ago. She was, she was reading a book about busyness and, and she said, she brought my attention to something from the book. She says, you know, um, we are one of the most technological, well, we are the most technologically advanced societies in, in history, right? History moves forward. And if you think of even something as simple as doing laundry, right? Think, think of how that has changed. A hundred years ago, if you had to do a load of laundry, think about what that would be like. It would be an all-day thing. You'd have to go out and you've got to, you know, you either boil a huge kettle of water, you go down to the river and, you know, you've got to scrub everything by hand and you've got to, you know, I don't know, wring it out or hang it up or whatever it is that you do. I don't know, did you iron it back then? I have no idea. Uh, maybe you did somehow, but, but the point is you spend a whole day doing that, and it's a massive amount of work, it's a massive amount of effort. Today, it's still work, I mean, it still takes some of your time, but my goodness, you've got washers and dryers that do all the hard work for you, it really takes a fraction of the work that it did 100 years ago, and you can take that concept and you can apply that to cooking and to cleaning, and to, I mean, think about how much easier life is today than it would have been 100 years ago. And yet... And yet, we are every bit as overwhelmed and stressed and overworked and we, we sort of have this sense that we're constantly going and there's constantly this pressure on us, the busyness. And it, and it seems like the rest is never there. And into that, God comes to us and he says, there's a promise that I'm making to you to give you rest. I'm going to give you the rest that you are longing for, the rest that you are hoping for, the rest that you so desperately need. Now, what does that rest actually look like? Well, a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, we need to understand that biblically, rest is not so much about putting your feet up and taking it easy for a little while. Rest is relational. Rest is relational. It's, it's what happens in the context of our relationship with God. Now, I'm going to show you that from this text. If you look with me, um, verse, uh, verse, verse 4 and verse 10, the idea is kind, of re, is, is kind of repeated here. For somewhere, he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. Now, when we say God rested, we do not mean, so he, he finishes creating heaven and earth. It does not mean that God said, I'm going to take a day off now and let the world run by itself for 24 hours. It can't mean that, right? God is always sustaining and caring for creation. So it's not that God takes it easy for a day. It's just God's work has finished. The work of creating is, is finished, and it's sort of a transition now into governing, right? So that's kind of the idea of rest. But then you notice in verse 10, it says, For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work just as God did for his, from his. So what the writer of Hebrews is really saying here is when we rest, what we're doing is we're, we're patterning our rest after God's rest. And one of the ways that we do that is we rest from our daily work, from the work that we, are, um, that, that often, um, that we often use our, our time to, to do. Now, what that means in, in the context of a relationship is pretty simple. When we rest from our daily work and our daily routine and our daily business, what we are doing, what we are really saying is that we are not defined by what we get done in a day or a week or a month. We're saying we trust God to be the one who manages and upholds and cares for not just all of creation, but our lives personally. Right? By resting, we're saying we are actually trusting God. 
We're trusting that our lives are not the product of everything that we do and get done. We're saying that we trust that God is caring for us, that God is the one who governs our lives. Work does not define you. Work does, your, and, and by the way, I'm using the term work there pretty broadly. I mean, your work, what it, maybe it's you know, taking care of your home, taking care of your loved ones, volunteering. It's the employment that you do. It's schoolwork. All those things, they don't define you. You are not defined by what you do. You trust that God cares for and governs you. And, he is, and, and by resting, you're actually making a, a declaration there. So, um, and here's the other part of it. Rest, you'll notice through this whole text, the author of Hebrews is talking about rest in terms of uh, the promised land, right? Entering into the rest. And it's talking about the Israelites going into Canaan, going into the promised land. That's kind of the, the picture of what rest is all about. Now again, um, when the Israelites entered into the promised land, they begin to experience this rest. It did not mean that they never had to farm the ground, you know, cultivate the vines, build houses. Of course they had to do all those things. Of course there was still lots of work to do, but the rest was deeper. The rest was the fact that God was pro- uh, protecting them and keeping them secure and safe from their enemies. It was rest from the threats of battle. It was resting, in other words, it was, and, and here's that relational idea coming in again, it was resting in God's care and protection for them. Right? Rest was all about living in relationship with God and trusting, in him, trusting him to protect them and care for them. Now, what does that mean for you and me? If you take these two ideas that rest is about, um, is, is, means that we're not defined by what we do and rest is about trusting in God's care, what does that mean for us? Well, when we think about what weekly worship is all about, um, one of the things that I think stands out is, I mean, one of the things we always want to do is say, well, okay, so what can you and can't you do on a Sunday, right? I mean, I think sometimes that's where our mind goes. What does God want us to do and not do on a Sunday? How do we observe this practically? And I'm going to say two things. I think there are two ways that we can honor God, uh, two, two, sort of two pieces that will help us to honor what God desires for us when it comes to um, the Sabbath. The first is this. Um, you rest from your regular routine, whatever that routine looks like, right? I mean, you don't do non-essential work. In our home, we don't do homework on Sundays. We take a break from all the busyness that defines daily life. We rest from that. We set it aside. Um, and we do that because it's a way of remembering, again, that we are not defined by everything that we get done. We, we are learning to trust God. We don't, um, you know, you don't do all those regular busy things because so often you buy into that idea that you are what you do. Um, You are what you get done off of your to-do list, right? And actually setting that all aside takes an enormous amount of trust in God, right? So that's one of the things that you do. Resting is about honoring God on on the day of rest means setting aside the busyness of your work as as uh, an act of trust in God's care. The second part of this um, is about worship, See, you and I live in, uh, in a culture that tries every single day to redefine who you are. Right? It, we, we live in a culture that tries to tell us what's really important, what we ought to set our hearts and our lives on, what we need for happiness, what we need for joy, what we need for success. We live in a culture that tells us through you know, advertising and through uh, media, through the movies, the TV, podcasts, all those sorts of things try to convince us of what we really need to be happy and successful and to live meaningful lives. When we get together for worship, worship is meant to reorient us to who really matters. Worship is meant to reorient us to the fact that rest, that, 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 um, that, that rest is relational, that we belong to God, that our primary identity is not defined by the world around us, but it's defined by who we are in relationship to God. Right? We started the, the service this morning with those words, um, how great is the love of the Father that is lavished on us that we are children of God. See, worship is meant to reorient our hearts to that reality so that when you go out into the world, and so you go to, when you go to work, when you go to school, when you're with your peers, your friends, that becomes primary. Your identity is primarily built on who you are in relationship to God. Now, um, the author of Hebrews, so, so that's, that's, that's the promise of rest. God makes a promise to give us rest in relationship with him. 
right? True rest is knowing who we are in relationship with God, trusting him to care for us and provide for us, keep watch over us. That's primarily um, what rest is all about. But what you'll notice, the author of Hebrews is not writing simply to impart theological information, right? He's not just giving a lecture on the topic of rest. His primary purpose is actually different. He's really writing to warn the people. Did you notice that? Just look with me. Um, look how he starts off there in verse 4. Um, uh, verse, uh, pardon me, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of us should be found to have fallen short of it. And he goes on. We've had the gospel preached just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value because they didn't combine it with faith. And he goes on and he says other things like that. He says, be careful that you don't miss out on the rest. In other words, what the author of Hebrews is doing here in chapter 4 is he's pointing back to the Old Testament and he's using the Israelites as sort of a negative example. He's saying God made this promise to them, but the people missed out. They missed the rest that God had promised. Now, how did they miss that rest? And what does it mean to miss that rest? How do we make sure that we heed that same warning that we too don't miss it. Well, there's two ways. The first is this. If you look in verses 2 and 3, the author of Hebrews unpacks this a little more. He says, We've had the gospel preached, but the message was of no value to them because they who heard it didn't combine it with faith. Right? So that's the first part. The Israelites, they they heard the message, but they didn't believe it. Um, you go a little further in verse 6. It still, stands at, uh, it still remains that some will enter the rest, and those who firm, formerly had the gospel didn't go in because of their disobedience. Um, so there's the, the first thing is this. The first warning here is that you don't miss the rest um, because you, you, the faith that you have does not produce obedience. Right? Um, look at it this way. And, and by the way, the Israelites, um, you know, what happened they, in the... In the um, in the wilderness, they believed, they, they believed in God, but the problem was it didn't translate into obedient living. See, the first way that you and I can miss out on rest is, is really by declaring um, autonomy. We say, well, I, I don't need God telling me how to live my life. I can do it myself. And in some senses, at least for a short while, sometimes that actually feels like it, it's working. Right, say, I don't need to do what, I don't, I don't need all those rules in my life. I don't need God, you know, spelling out all these things about how I can live. I just need to try to be a good person. And you sort of define what that looks like all on your own. The author of Hebrews is saying that's the same kind of mistake that the Israelites made. They rejected God's authority over their lives. And when you do that, when you, when you try to live life on your own terms, sooner or later, it invites chaos and brokenness and pain into your life. It's, the, it's anything but restful. Right, because you invite the consequences of disobedience into your life and you bring that into your home and into your marriage and into your relationships. You think it's okay to do it on your own terms, live on your own terms, but sooner or later it invites brokenness and pain and chaos. And it's anything but restful. That's what happened to the Israelites. That's part one. The other part of it, the second part of it is, um, and this one's a little more, I'd say it's a little more oh, complex maybe is the right word. If you look in verse three, um, the author of Hebrews, he quotes the Old Testament, Psalm 95, and he, he says, um, he, the, the quotation from Psalm, Psalm 95 says, So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Now, uh, and then a little later, by the way, verse 7, same thing. That's, a, that's another quotation from Psalm 95. Psalm 95 was a psalm that praised God, but it also gave a warning that the people don't be stubborn and reject uh, God's providence. And Psalm 95 refers back to Exodus chapter 17. So it's easy to kind of lose track of the, the trail here. But Psalm 95 is quoting Exodus 17. So you have Hebrews 4, quoting Psalm 95, quoting Exodus chapter 17. Let's boil it down, make it very simple. Exodus chapter 17 tells the story of the Israelites in the middle of the wilderness. And they, they start to complain against Moses and they start to complain about God. They say, God's brought us into the middle of this desert just to die. God is not taking care of us. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's not leading us. He's not providing for us. We don't want God's care for us any longer. You can go read the whole story in Exodus chapter 17. What that was was a rejection of God's providence, a rejection of his care for his people. 
And to put it a little differently, to the extent that you and I reject God's sovereignty, his providence, his care for us, we won't experience rest. Look at it a little differently. These times are some of the most uncertain times most of us have ever lived through, right? COVID-19. Think how much uncertainty there is. And many of these questions are valid questions, right? Are your kids going to go back to school in the fall in person? How are you going to school them online? When are we going to get to go back to work? All those questions, there's a million of them. Good questions. Questions that we don't know the answer to. And I'm not trying to pretend that this is just a simple, oh, you just got to trust God and everything will be fine. But what I am saying is that to the extent that we learn the practice of trusting God's sovereignty and his providence, trusting that he is in control, trusting that even if we don't understand it, he is ordering and arranging all things according to his plan. To the extent that we trust that, our hearts find rest. Our hearts find much deeper rest. It's easy to miss it. It's easy to, it is easy to become anxious. It is very easy to drift into that sense of uncertainty and fear. But the assurance of God's word says you can trust in him because he holds every molecule in the universe and every millisecond that passes us by in his sovereign hands. And so the call in verse 11, if you look at verse 11, the author of Hebrews spells out all this promise of rest and a warning not to miss it. And then he says in verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following the example of disobedience. Now, that brings us to the final question. How do you enter that rest? How do you experience that deep rest for your soul? How do you experience that rest trusting in God's care? Well, the author goes on in verses 12 and 13 and says something that seems completely disconnected from the rest of the text. In fact, some scholars and commentators say, well, this actually belongs at the next section, right? Because he goes on and talks about the word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword. And then it says in verse 13, nothing in creation is hidden. Everything is uncovered and laid bare. Literally, the text says everything is uh, naked and vulnerable or naked and exposed, And you and I are reading that and we're left thinking, what in the world does that have anything to do with rest? The answer is actually, it makes perfect sense when you think about it, because um, earlier in the text, remember the author of Hebrews was taking us back to Genesis chapter 2 and was talking about how God creates the world and finishes the world and then God rests. And if you remember that story in Genesis chapter 2, you remember that God creates Adam and Eve in the garden, he places them in the garden, And they are naked and unashamed. They're vulnerable. They're exposed. And they're in relationship with God. And they're in the kind of relationship that where there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to cover up. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's that kind of vulnerability. And if it's it's true that rest is relational, rest is what happens when you're in perfect relationship with God, then obviously Adam and Eve had perfect rest in God's care. Right? They know God and they are known perfectly and completely by God in every possible way. Right? And that's, that's, what hap- that's what rest is for us too. When you're able to be completely vulnerable, completely known, completely laid bare in the presence of God, the problem with that, the challenge is that if you or I are to be laid completely bare, if, you are, if, if, if everything about our hearts and our minds is put out on the table, my goodness, there's no resting then. Because as, as Hebrews uh, 4 says, God's word exposes so much about what is broken and vulnerable and shameful and hidden in our own hearts and in our own minds. Right? God's word actually, it, it, God's word as you read it and as, God, as, you, as you hear it and take it in, it actually reveals that there's so much that is broken about us. There's so much that falls short. And if that's true, then in relationship with God, you will never be at rest. You will never be at rest. If you really want to experience rest, what has to happen is God's word has to do that, the the work of a surgeon exposing us, and that's incredibly painful, right? God's word has to expose our hidden thoughts and our hidden desires and our hidden ambitions. God's word has has to go to work so that nothing is hidden in our lives, So how do you experience rest then? Well, 
Jesus, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus, you may remember, Jesus actually says this. Jesus, he says, come to me. Everyone who's weary and everyone who's burdened, come to me and I'll give you the rest. In other words, God doesn't just give us his word that exposes our hidden thoughts and ambitions and desires. God gives us a savior who invites us to himself and he gives us the rest. And how does he give us that rest? How does Jesus give us that rest? Well, you remember on the cross, Jesus himself becomes completely naked, completely exposed. He's hung up there completely ashamed. Not because of who he is, but because all of our sin and all of our shortcomings and all of our guilt is actually placed on him. Everything that's wrong with us gets put on Jesus. Jesus becomes, as Hebrew, in the words of Hebrews 4, Jesus becomes um, exposed and laid bare. And he loses his rest. He loses his relationship with his father on the cross. Right? He cries out, why have you forsaken me? He loses that. Why? So that you and I might gain the rest. So that you and I might be found righteous. So that you and I might be declared perfect in God's sight. Right on the cross, Jesus says, what are the other things? He says, the last thing he says, it is finished. The work is done. Everything has been completed. Right? We can, we can rest because Jesus completed the true work for us. He bore our guilt and our sin and everything wrong with us. He took it away from us. So that now when God looks at you, he doesn't see you as the sum total of all your, resol- all your failures and sin and guilt and shame. And neither does he see you, by the way, as the sum total of all the things that you do in a week. He sees you through Jesus as his child. Right? Rest is relational. Rest is relational. Jesus loses the rest so that we might gain it. Jesus loses the relationship so that we might be brought in. Now, now the question is, have you experienced that? Have you experienced that rest? Do you experience that day by day? Right? When you go to work doesn't mean you get to be a lazy worker. Of course not. It actually means that you, you work hard, but you're serving God. You're not working as a way of sort of establishing your identity and who you are. You're working out of the rest. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced that rest? You live with that rest day by day. Right? Rest is so much more about what you do or don't do on a Sunday. Rest is what you experience when you were drawn into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.